need to say from a logistics point of view, I'm gonna hand it over to uh, the, the co-chair of the, the Active Trace Group that put this together, uh, Lisa Purcell. Lisa? Thanks, Joe. Um, all right, so if we go to the next slide, I think, you know, we've gone through this a couple of times in the previous seminars, but just to orient for anyone who hasn't been um, attending the previous seminars, um, we are really interested in effective function from a, a vaccine point of view, as well as uh, antibody point of view from monoclonal antibodies, because we're, you know, very focused on the fab, but not necessarily focused on, on the FC. And the goal overall, as Joe was alluding to, is to review some of the data, some of the conclusions, what we've learned in res with respect to, to COVID and maybe pull in some other infectious disease to think about uh, vaccines and antibody therapies um, and understand you know, whether or not this is a, it's something that we would like to harness or something we would like to avoid. I think we've heard some conflicting opinions so far, which has been, uh, been interesting. If we go to the next slide, right. So I wanted to highlight that we've assembled two really uh, important groups to focus on two very key questions, or what we think are key questions around effector function. Uh, one is the standardization of effector function assays group, which is led by Annie Zumstag. Um, and you can see the list of participants here, really a tour de force around effector function and the assays that have been used. Um, really humbling to, to hear from everyone in that group. And then the second group, which uh, Galit really assembled and led, um, was this translation of preclinical effector to clinical COVID experience group. And that was really the, the focus of that group has been on these seminar series to understand how we could actually use this information as we move forward. And so you can see, again, the powerhouses that are on this group, <laughs> including Galit, um, to really think about this, this question. So if we go to the next slide, I think it's outlining. Yeah, so the next seminar, just before we get into to, to our Turo seminar, is on the 18th of January, 2023, which is a little crazy. Um, and it's from Margie and Adam um, looking at animal models of effector function, as well as signaling mechanisms and phagocytosis and viral clearance by macrophages. And so um, those, both of those presentations will be done on the same day. Um, the link, um, if you don't have it, I think Trey put it in the, in the chat, um, but you can access both the link for the seminar as well as the recordings from the previous seminars from Jim and Mika and, and Mark um, and, and then Arturo. Um, on that, that link. So if we go to the next slide today, uh, we have Dr. Kassadaval. I'm very excited to hear from him. Um, I had to make a lot of notes because I think we could spend the next 45 or 50 minutes going through just the impact that Arturo has had in this space over the last many years. Um, he is, now at Johns Hopkins um, and is uh, the Bloomberg Distinguished Professor, Alfred and Jill Summer Chair of the Molecular Micro and Immunology Group there. Um, received his MD and PhD um, from NYU um, and then did his internship and residency at uh, Bellevue um, and then specializes in ID at, at Albert Einstein. Um, where, where we first met. Um, he's authored over 900 books, chapters, papers, uh, did a lot of work in fungal pathogenesis. Um, and if you haven't read any of his work there, it's really interesting. He's made a lot of biological discoveries in uh, fungi that are super important and really is um, focused on antibody action as well as um, convalescent serum during the COVID pandemic. Uh, Editor-in-Chief of MBio, um, served on the National Science Board for Biosecurity and the National Commission on Forensic Science. Uh, really interesting. I'm sure you have a lot of interesting stories there. And then many honors. Again, I'd probably be here for a very, very, very long time. Um, but uh, he has been elected into American Society of Clinical Investigation, um, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, National Ac Academy of Medicine, and the National Academy of Sciences. So... With that, 
I'm going to turn it over to Arturo. Um, I'm really excited to hear your seminar. Um, you really pioneered a lot of the convalescent work uh, in COVID-19. Um, so I'm really, really excited to hear um, your perspective on that and effector function. Thank you so much, Lisa. Uh, it's one of the, thank you for inviting me and for reconnecting. It turns out that uh, we, we interacted about 10 years ago when I was at Einstein. Uh, and uh, this talk, I think, uh, has a lot of lessons uh, for antibody-based therapy. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share the screen. Ooh, it came up right away. Uh, so I need to, so what I'm, we're going to talk about convalescent in, in the post monoclonal antibody era, but I want to emphasize that the post monoclonal antibody era is probably transitory since I suspect industry will bring us new monoclonals. However, as of today, we got an email that Hopkins is no longer using every show. There is no monoclonals anymore here for immunocompromised patients. We are only using convalescent plasma. Uh, disclosures, I serve in the Scientific Advisory Board of SAP Therapeutics, and I chair the Convalescent Plasma Group that I'll tell you a little bit more about. So three types of antibody preparations using COVID, Convalescent Plasma, cheap, keeps up with the variants, disadvantage, heterogeneous product, difficult to standardize. Hyperimmune IVIG uh, is a purified IV preparation with a defined amount. The disadvantages it like lacks other isotypes that are known to be very important in neutralization. But the biggest problem is that it always lags by six months because it takes six months to make it. Uh, and it's a monoclonal, so the defined product that you're all aware of, the disadvantages are narrow specificity, and that has been the big vulnerability. Most, if not all, have been defeated by the variants. Uh, this was a tweet in October, which was uh, pre-exit, uh, basically, um, the warning then there was that we will lose all the monoclonals and it will take about a month uh, before that happened. So the situation today is hyperimmune IVIG is not under EUA and not being used. I should add that several trials have been done, but it's been tested in conditions in which it cannot work. It's been tested in conditions in hospitalized patients. Therefore, the jury's out. I suspect that it can be made to work if it used early on disease. It's a monoclonals, uh, the variants have defeated all commercial monoclonals as of now, and convalescent plasma remains viable under EUA in the United States. Now, all three of these have the same active ingredient, specific antibody. They differ in preparation. So it's always keep in the back of your mind that they, if one works, you can probably make the other one work. So I'm gonna talk about convalescent plasma. And this is a story of triumph, tragedy, and renaissance. So serum therapy was the first effective therapy in medicine. It was developed in the 1890s. And here I'll read you something from that time. Thomas Shastid was a well-known physician. I found the boy very ill, the whole back of the throat being like a white velvet. I had never used the new remedy before, but determined to try it to save the boy's life. I injected a small quantity into the skin of the stomach and I watched the throat. I can only compare it to the marvelous result of the disappearance of snow under a hot sun. They saw results pretty quickly. Uh, that's Goya's painting. It's a horrible disease, diphtheria. Parents saw their children asphyxiate in front of them and they couldn't do anything. This led to the first Nobel Prize in medicine given to Emil von Behring. It should have been shared with Kirasato, but even the first Nobel is controversial. And if you look at the history of antibody therapy for infectious disease, it takes off in the early 1900s. It has an enormous effect on immunology. It helps the growth of immunology, things like serotypes, uh, antibody. You know, antibody was not even known to be a separate protein till the 1920s. A lot of science went into this. Incidentally, the DNA story comes out of this because pneumococcus, uh, they were looking at the, at the, at the scape variants, that is the A-capsular ones, and the transforming principle was in fact discovered at Rockefeller in one of the labs that was interested in serum therapy. And then the antimicrobials come in and it gets abandoned. 
And then it largely misses the biologic revolution. If you go into the hospital today, most monoclonals are not used for infectious disease. So then we had COVID and we have had a renaissance in antibody-based therapies. Convalescent serum or plasma. So it's used interchangeably. Serum is the old preparation. The way you make serum is you let the blood clot, you spin it down, and that's serum. With plasma, you recover it by plasmapheresis and it retains the clotting compounds. It's been used in practically every emergency since serum therapy was discovered. And even as the late 40s, it was used for outbreaks or mumps. A meta analysis from 1918 suggested that it works reducing mortality by about 20%. A very influential paper in the early days of the COVID pandemic. But then it was abandoned. And it was, for bacterial diseases, it was abandoned because it was a better option. Antimicrobials. Simply, serum therapy could not compete with penicillin or sulfonamides. However, for viral diseases, it was abandoned for another reason. And that was the discovery of serum hepatitis. And this began in the 19, in late 30s. Remember, for, for, for a bacteria, you can always immunize a horse. For virology, it was not sufficiently developed that it could provide antigens to companies. So it ended up that, it, that people used you know, convalescent plasma, but they didn't know about hepatitis B or C. And that was what led to the end of it. But the one of the things that was learned during those 40 years was that you had to use it early, period. And this was forgotten. And it's, it will, as I'm about to show you, it's completely was forgotten during most of the COVID pandemic. And I will read something to you from a giant of that time, uh, Cecil, who used to write the textbook of medicine that went through like 30 editions. It is a fundamental principle of all serum therapy that to obtain the best results, the serum must be given early in disease. This statement holds true regardless of whether one is using antitoxin or antibacterial serum. In fact, one of my frustrations in the early days of the pandemic was that history had been forgotten. I'm, you can tell I'm very much into, into reading the old literature. And there are, in fact, three principles to antibody therapies. You have the specificity principle. You must, the, the antibody preparation must bind to, to it. Believe it or not, some clinical trials were done when it was looked backwards, the, the convalescent plasma had no antibody in a significant number of the, of the uh, uh, units. The quantitative principle, you must give sufficient antibody to get an, an effect. And then there is the temporal principle, which is the most difficult for physicians, which is a, to be effective and must be given early in disease. And here is data from the Journal of Experimental Medicine in 1913. If you want to treat meningococcal meningitis, yes, you can give it directly into the spinal canal so you don't have to worry about the blood-brain barrier. If you give it on the first day, the mortality is 18%. If you wait until the fourth or seventh day, the mortality is 27%. After the seventh day, the mortality is just not that different than the untreated. So given uh, in the February, in January and February, as the pandemic was going on, I, you can tell I, I knew this story and people were talking about monoclonal vaccines and virus. Nobody seemed to be talking about convalescent plasma. And I wanted to try to get the word out. And the, and the question is, how do you do it? Well, I could, I was, I was associate editor of journal of clinical investigation and bio. You could put it in there, but nobody's going to read it. So I decided to write an op-ed. And I tried the New York Times, they didn't want it. I tried the Washington Post, they didn't want it. I tried a bunch of other places. But like everything in life, it's luck. I sent it to the Wall Street Journal on the day that the market tanked. And this was a bit of good news. So they published it within 24 hours, the idea that you could do something. And what I wrote about was the story about a prep school in uh, the I knew this paper in Pennsylvania, in which this physician, Roswell Gallagher, who would go on to become a major figure in adolescent medicine in the 20th century, treated an outbreak by having a kid who, who had uh, measles donate his serum and then and then given to the ones that have been exposed. And they essentially stopped the, the epidemic with only a couple of kids getting sick with mild disease. So the good thing about having an editorial is that then you could send it to all your friends. So I sent it to all my friends. I happen to know Michael Joyner at Mayo Clinic, and there is the email exchange. 
He was in an Atlanta hotel. He's an anesthesiologist. He had never heard of serum therapy. Why? Because we don't teach history in medical school. And, but he knew that, that they give 25 million units of plasma in this country, transfusions. So there was a huge capacity and that this could be scaled very rapidly. And this is gonna become very important because he will lead the, uh, the registry, the FDH registry in about a month after that email. So I wanna to talk to you about something else. And that is that we have a lot of problems in this country, but we can still do things. And this was noted by the Tucker Bill when he traveled the United States. He noted that in the United States, in contrast to Europe, people came together and did things. Whereas in Europe, it was always reliance on the central government. So um, what happened after that was that I got together with a lot of my friends here at Hopkins and Alana, and we decided to try to put together a group that would kind of shepherd this if it was done. And this is the timeline of, of March, 2020. Um, the Hopkins team organized by the first week. Then we realized that you couldn't write IRB protocols with, with a op-ed at the Washington. So Lizzie Ann Porosky and I sat down and wrote overnight, basically all the history, all the stuff we needed to put in IRB applications. Then we formed the Convalescent Plasma Project and by the third week, the FDA was allowing compassionate use. Uh, and by the 27th, the first patient was treated. And what was happening is I had my 15 minutes of fame. I can tell you a lot about waiting for, to talk on TV. This, this is something uh, that can be a whole seminar about. But what happened if the FDA re received an overwhelming number of requests for plasma use? Look, there was nothing to give to patients. And they decided they create, they wanted a single access protocol and they create, and they, had, they needed a place that had a national IRB. So they contacted the Mayo Clinic to run it and then joined and became the DPI. And that is gonna provide the first evidence of efficacy and safety in the United States. This is the group. Uh, we were all linked by being friends. Lizanne Porowski and I, long-term collaborators at Einstein, Nigel Panis, uh, was somebody that I was interested that we knew from. He's an epidemiologist from working some process of science. Shmuel Shohan here at Hopkins volunteer on the first call to write a protocol, and this was the group. And we continue to meet. In fact, we meet every Thursday night because the problems uh, continue to. There are a lot of problems to be addressed. So we put up a website. Amazon built the website for us in those uh, days. And the main role of the website was to distribute protocols uh, so that people could just have access to all the information. So in the spring and summer of 2020, convalescent plasma is deployed in the United States without the usual evidence of efficacy. Simultaneously, dozens of clinical trials are launched in many countries to test efficacy. And here is the problem. Most focus on very sick patients where history tell you that antibody therapies don't work. In other words, they, were, they set up trials that could not work, and then they concluded that it didn't work. And we'll cover that in a minute, in a couple of minutes. And in August 23rd, the, the Food and Drug Administration allowed the, EU, the emergency use authorization for convalescent plasma that remains in effect, and more than 50 million patients were treated. So what people always wanted to know was, is it safe and does it work? In this spring and summer of 2020, I happy to to share my inbox, people were very worried about things like antibody dependent uh, enhancement, uh, antibody triggering a cytokine storm by cross-linking FC receptors, all those things. Basically, I knew history and I thought everything, all those concerns were really remote, but they, you couldn't dismiss it. But by May, there was clearly evidence that you could infuse antibody to people who were infected with probable viremia and this was quite safe. And in fact, giving a unit of plasma was associated with very, very few side effects. So the first paper was published in JCI, the second paper about three months later on the first 20,000. So does it work? Well, I'm gonna take you through lines of evidence and these are all very different. Mechanism of action, animal studies, the EAP data analysis, what Joyner did, what we're gonna call the registry, observational studies, randomized clinical trials, real world data, experiments in nature and population data. Notice that they all say yes, one says mixed. 
The only part of the evidence where things have been mixed have been randomized controlled trials, but that can be explained. So mechanism of action, I think everyone on this call knows that, that antibody is an antiviral, period. Uh, it neutralizes and it can be used. And this was known in the very, from the very first infusions that if you gave this convalescent plasma, the vi you could actually clear the virus. This was even a, a paper from China in the, in the spring of 2020. Uh, convalescent plasma is, um, it's a highly hetero with many, uh, with at least four antiviral activity. I think Margie's on the call. I think this is uh, part of her work. Uh, and what you need to know is that every unit is different, no surprise, but there are a lot of activities. And the only thing that we measure is usually titer and neutralizing, a, a neutralizing titer. But probably the efficacy is, is, a, is a complex function of all these uh, activities. Uh, it was shown that it also in 2020 that when you administer this to patient, you douse the inflammation. Um, several papers showed that the administration of plasma would result in less inflammation. And again, what kills you in COVID is inflammatory response. So this will be consistent with efficacy. And there have been other studies. Uh, also shown early in 2020, this is the comparison of the drugs then uh, this is uh, how little we had. Uh, so there were certainly no monoclonals, no Paxlovid. You could see that convalescent plasma was the single most potent antiviral uh, in 2020. If you take convalescent plasma and you give it to animal models, whether they are serum hunters, non-human primates, mass protein, they are protected. So that's one of the checks that you could do. You could transfer it to animals and it works in animals. And then, and then by the summer of 2020, and I was honored to be part of this study, I worked with Mike and I worked with the FDA, many early morning calls with the FDA statisticians. The problem was as follows. It was, the FDA was getting a lot of criticism and so was the government for supporting a, a trial without clinical evidence. And the question was, if you look at the registry, can you find evidence for efficacy? Now, remember, in the registry, every single patient is treated. So you're not going to have a negative control. But what, what you can do is you, all these patients have been treated blindly. Physicians and neither the patient knows what the antibody content in a unit is. So when the support of the FDA and BARDA, what was done is the antibody titers were determined. Uh, it was very clear that there was a dose response, that the pa patients who received the more antibody were less likely to die than the ones that receive units with less antibody. And consistent with what history would have told you, if you treat patients in the first three days, the mortality was 27 lower than if you treat after day four. This is a very time serve. So this was posted as a preprint in the summer of 2020, eventually published in the New England Journal in the winter of 2021. And unfortunately, uh, plasma became politicized because instead of looking into this data, those days, people, oh, how, they don't have a control group. Come on. I mean, it's in a way you were trying to find data in a, in a, in a, from a very different uh, angle. And what I would say to you is that if you're a scientist, a dose control result is a very powerful piece of, of evidence. So uh, I also became available in 2020 was observational studies. Uh, one was done at... Mm -hmm. There are many of these now in the literature. Uh, the ones uh, public, the one from the first on the left is from Sinai, and I work with them. And it, again, if you treat people before they get intubated, there was a difference in mortality. If you treat people who are intubated, no difference in mortality, no surprise. What puts you in the unit is inflammation. And I, we don't think we expect antibody to reverse inflammation. And a very important study was done by, uh, by Jim Moser and Eric Salazar uh, Methodist, and they showed uh, two curves. You can see they are within three days and after three days. The curves within three days of admission, quite separate. Of course, after three days, it's the same result as in the, as in the EAP, but now with a control group. And in fact, they were able to analyze this and they identified a critical 44-hour window for plasma administration. 
And I'm going to anticipate to say to you is that most of the clinical trials that were published in 2021 gave the antibody in many cases after that, after 44 hours. So, uh, what, and so, but the randomized clinical trial data is mixed. And look at that red cloud. Those are antibody trials that did not show efficacy. And look at the green on the bottom. Those are the ones that show efficacy. And what you can see is what is expected. If you give high titer, in some cases early, you get efficacy. Sometimes if you give very high titers, you can compensate and get, a, and get an effect even if the, if the patient is, is later in the course of disease. There is one red trial there, CONVERT, the published in the Lancet of Respiratory Medicine. It turns out that in that trial, they used methylene blue-treated plasma. And one of the things that was known in the pre-antibiotic era was that methylene blue will deactivate FC receptor binding. So to me, even though we're trying to work with them to see what, whether, whether we can show that methylene blue deactivates antibody, that will provide you a very powerful control for FC receptor function and we need for it. The orange ones means that they have a partial efficacy. Real world data. Uh, here I just took the, the digital abstract from a paper published in JCI. Uh, <clears throat> uh, this was also available in 2020. What they did is, this is the Health Corporation of America. They basically use artificial intelligence to go into their database. This is no bias here. They're looking at, uh, it's not like you're matching by bias, this is matching by computer. And if you treat it early, uh, you look, they got a 47% reduction in mortality when it was given within three days of admission. And then there came the, the experiments of nature, which is to immunocompromise patients. And this began as a series, a, a case series. Uh, the early one was done by Michael Thompson um, and Jeff Henderson at, at WashU. And they show very early that these patients often didn't mount antibodies. And if you gave them plasma, you give them some sort of replacement therapy. Uh, and this is something that we simply posted on the on Meta Archive a couple of weeks ago. There is now randomized controlled trial data as well as cohort data. And what you can see is that all the points are to the right, to the left of zero. So basically, everyone has looked at it, patients benefit. And today, it, this is the only antibody-based therapy that is available in the United States. So epidemi uh, how about the epidemiology data? So working with blood bankers, we're able to get the data on all, the, all that was done. And what you can see here is the usage in the United States. Uh, and you can see that there were weeks in the United States that as many as 30,000 units were used. Uh, in patients. So the capacity to do this, it exists, it is there, it can be ramped up, uh, and it largely follows uh, the number of cases. So what you can do with that is you can plot the mortality in the United States versus how much plasma was used. And what appears is a very strong inverse correlation. The more plasma the country used, the fewer people die. And from that, you can actually calculate how many lives were saved in the first year of the pandemic, and we estimate about 100,000 lives. So sadly, now the clinical trials begin to, to be reported. It's the winter of 2021, and this is the tragedy part. Recovery reports that they get no effect. Uh, the, the trial in Canada, Concord, also the trial in Iraq. So instead of looking at the trial and seeing that in fact, and the plasma is being treated in conditions when it probably cannot work, Physicians say it doesn't work. They stop using it. And here is the drop in plasma. And the, what is so sad to me and so frustrating is that American physicians were using it right. This study by Mosafari and CID shows that the majority of plasma was being given on the day of admission. No trial except one RCT tests on the day of admission. They randomize and then they often order the plasma. Many of the patients in these clinical trials are getting the plasma after the window by which they would work. In other words, they're testing it in conditions when it cannot work, and then they're concluding that it doesn't work, and then physicians are stopped using it. And from that data, we can estimate that there were 
30,000 excess deaths in the United States over three months. And, you know, uh, to me, that is a tragedy because you had a therapy that was being used. You had a therapy for which you had no alternative. And yet the data was interpreted as it doesn't work. So I would argue to you that convalescent plasma has climbed the epistemic ladder uh, the historic, from historical legacy to the basic science foundation, to the convalescence in animal models, to mortality inversely related to usage, to observational studies, to, prevent, to the human dose relationship and to the randomized uh, controlled trials, which if you look at the ones that used it early and with high titer, you got it to work. By the way, monoclonals don't work on hospitalized patients. So had the monoclonal agents been, been tested in the same way as the plasma was tested in randomized clinical trials, doctors will, <laughs> will have concluded that they don't work. But you know, again, it's, you're not expected to work in a setting when a patient has, is, being, is hypoxic from severe inflammation of the lung. So here is something else that came out of the, of the uh, registry study that was unexpected. Local plasma was better than distant plasma. And what happened is they had tens of thousands of, of, um, of points, or that is people that were treated and they had outcome. And they basically asked artificial intelligence to look for things that correlated. And one of the things that strongly correlated was that the convalescent plasma was quite effective provided that it was obtained less than 150 miles from where it was used. No surprise. Now we know that even cities have their own quasi-species. But this also tells you how the convalescent plasma is discriminated so to those, to those uh, strains. And here is another problem with many of the randomized controlled trials. In order to control, they basically often set up serum banks that then distribute the plasma nationally. And this would have been another reason, apart from the problems in the design, by which they may have not seen uh, efficacy. So then is the win then is last year at this time, and now uh, it gets a second look. Omicron appeared uh, 13 months ago, and it defeated most of the initial antibody monoclonals that were being used. So then we were left with two antibodies. We were left with Evershell. We were left with a couple of others that I can't pronounce. Uh, and also the, the Hopkins randomized controlled trial, which was the only outpatient trial in the United States, showed efficacy. I'll show you that data in a minute. Immunosuppressed patients present began to be, emerge as the big problem. Most of the population by then was either getting immunity from infection or vaccination, but the immunosuppressed patients were presenting major issues. They often can't clear the infection. And if they're B cell depleted, they're not gonna to respond to vaccines. And so here, the polyclonal uh, quality of plasma appear to be a, uh, a, an advantage. And the FDA moved rapidly after getting the, F the Hopkins data and recommended allowing outpatient use. And the IDSA also recommended outpatient use. So then we also get a break. And that is that people who are immunized and get COVID or vice versa have such high antibody titers that they neutralize all the variants. This is a remarkable immunology here. That is, if you get, if you got immunized and then you get Delta, the plasma neutralized Omicron. Uh, it, it may not have prevented you from getting ill because you're not getting pro antibody protection in the open airs. But this is the reason people are not dying uh, in part. I mean, we know T cells are important too. But the point is that the plasma, what we call Bax plasma, that is plasma from individuals who are vaccinated and have COVID neutralizes the variants. So we are, the country is currently awash with high quality plasma. And there's another study that we posted, basically depending on how you do it, these individuals are such high titers that they neutralize the variants, probably by a combination of mass action, as well as the oral epitope spreading that they basically recognize even variants that they didn't see. Uh, in early 2022, the United States, the, the uh, CONTAIN, which was a trial run by my colleague, Lizanne Porosky at, at Montefiore and NYU, 
uh, showed the data and out of it came a remarkable algorithm in which they can predict the, the likelihood of somebody benefiting. And this is individual patient data. This algorithm is in the open. You can go there and you can put in the... the so here is the interesting things. WHO score three, which is early on, no surprise, largest benefit uh, from plasma. It's interesting though that they identified a small subset of people who are very sick, who don't appear, who you would have predicted based on history that don't benefit from plasma, who also seem uh, to benefit from it. This may include individuals who are immunosuppressed. And they, in that situation, they're getting the, uh, the plasma as replacement therapy. And David Sullivan uh, carried out the outpatient trial at Hopkins. And this was unlike every other randomized controlled trial. From the beginning, the idea was to treat it early. Uh, very difficult to do outpatient trial that involve infusion to infected individuals. How would you do it? They, you know, it's not the kind of thing that you can bring in outpatients. It is randomized, double-blinded. The control used convalescent plasma. And they saw a 54 reduction in the progression to disease. It was safe. And within six days of a public announcement, Hopkins took the unusual step of doing a press conference. We, uh, this is, Hopkins is, this is not the kind of thing that we do, give a science by news conference, but the preprint was also put out and the FDA allowed our patient use on December 27th. It was published in the New England Journal in the spring. And here is some of the ingenuity of the group. Uh, this is one of the, these are some of the tents. They set up tents in parking lots and they needed to have crash carts because remember there is a, with plasma, there is a small probability of a severe uh, transfusion reaction. So they didn't see any, but you needed to always be prepared. And uh, it was uh, an example of ingenuity. You can see the snow. Uh, they treated patients through the, the heat of the summer and the cold of the winter. So how does plasma compare with monoclonals? This is um, posted on a preprint. The paper has been favorable review. It should be out soon. Uh, look at the data for CCSS4. That's the randomized clinical trial. Less than five days is just as good as the monoclonals. Uh, if you treat early, no surprise, right? It's the same active ingredient. A monoclonal, you get a lot of one type of antibody. Polyclonal, you get very little of any one antibody, but you have the benefit of many epitopes, many isotypes, probably many FC functions. So the situation today is that the polyclonal nature of convalescent plasma makes it a superior therapy in the B cell deficient. There is a lot of data these patients have a whopping, very large viral loads. And we know, we know from the experience that if you have a, an antibody that is monovalent in this population, it is going to be it's likely to select four variants that are going to be resistant. This has been known for many years with other viral diseases and animal models. Uh, the convalescent plasma from people with COVID and vaccine covers all the variants. And you could say that one of the legacies of this time is that we have learned how to use convalescent plasma effectively. My hope is that when we have now had seven major viral outbreaks in the 21st century, I can tell you SARS-1, MERS, COVID, Zika, Ebola, uh, HN1, and there's one more that kind of escapes me. Uh, well, you can add monkeypox to that. Uh, the, there is gonna be another one of these and it again is gonna catch us with no therapy. And when that happens, people are going to use convalescent plasma again. Our hope is that when that happens, this time would have given the, the clin good clinical data, randomized clinical data, how to use this stuff, how to use it. You need to use it early and you need to, and you, and you need to find the highest diet available. Uh, it has continues to have uh, a billing code. Uh, this is very important today because as we are now again using it in patients, uh, this, the, there is a cost to getting convalescent plasma and it's important that the blood bankers are reimbursed. Uh, this is a, an, uh, a product with no profit, no, no patents, no pharmaceutical support, 
uh, it depends on altruistic donors and it depends on on uh, the ability, the availability of transfusion facilities. I want to say a couple of words about pediatric use. Uh, no major studies reported to date, but again, a uh, small case series suggested it's well tolerated, and there are numerous case reports that it's useful in immunocompromised, and particularly with B cell defects. So I think we can say that it's probably safe. Efficacy data are largely anecdotal, but I think nobody would be surprised that if you extrapolate from the adults. Uh, that this is, and what we know of antibody therapies, that this uh, should work. So the big roller coaster. So in 2020, convalescent plasma is up. Basically, physicians are giving it to everybody. Uh, and the Mayo Clinic expanded access program produces clear evidence of efficacy. 2021, see, convalescent plasma is down. Does this a randomized trial have completed? The results are mixed. Uh, negative a physicians favor the negative evidence over the positive evidence. Plasma falls out of favor, use falls markedly. Uh, the, the NIH, WHO, the IDSA recommend against plasma. Eventually, the IDSA will reverse itself. The NIH recommendations st uh, remain still neutral. And the, with the WHO, it's an embarrassment uh, because this is one of the few things that is available. In, in low income countries, and they have not updated the recommendations that were posted last December based on data from six months earlier. And uh, I, I think that that kind of speaks for itself. 2022, convalescent plasma is back up. Hopkins uh, patient trial, the Omicron defeats the variants, uh, uh, defeats most monoclonal therapies, but not convalescent plasma. The FDA allow, modifies the EUA to allow patient usage. The IDSA recommends that patient to our patients. Since then, the AABB, ISIL-9, and a bunch of other organizations are recommending it. Uh, but the, it continues to be that really high quality plasma is scarce, supply problem. So what is the problem today? The problem today is educational. The fact is that people, the blood bankers stopped collecting it because they weren't being used. So in a way, you got to prime the, pr the pump. You got you to bring people in. Uh, but it's also true that most of the countries are washed with high-quality plasma. It is estimated that just from blood growers, the one out of three units in the country has an amount of antibody far superior to anything that was used in 2020 as a result of COVID-19 and the vaccine. And the Red Cross, again, began collecting plasma. So it is available in the United States. But we are part of the reason we continue to meet is because there are shortages. A lot of education has to get done. A lot of people still, when they hear convalescent plasma, the first reaction is, I heard it doesn't work. Uh, and I want to end to paraphrase my good friend Nigel Panis in the leadership. So in 2020, convalescent plasma is great. Give it to everybody. 2021, convalescent plasma does not work. And what has happened with most theories, convalescent plasma works in the right patients we use well. So I oh I three adjectives. So this is a story of triumph. The United States went from zero use to using it in three weeks, and by several months later was putting out 25,000 units a week. And we think that it saved 100,000 lives. It is a tragedy when physicians abandoned in early 2021, it should be 2020, based on negative results from European RCTs that tested antibody therapy in conditions when it could not work. And then it didn't work. We documented the retreat from plasma resulting in about 30,000 deaths in the United States. And it's now undergoing a renaissance as a result of Omicron. I think my last slide, is that my last slide? No, this is my final words. So uh, as I said, convalescent plasma has no profit, no industry, no patents. Uh, the story in the United States illustrates the can-do spirit and self-associations that took a little more in 1830. We have a lot of problems in this country but we can still organize and we can get things done. And no other country uh, certainly did what was done in the United States with, with regards to mobilization. A good legacy of the COVID-19 calamity is that we have learned how to use it, which is critical for the next one. Uh, I believe convalescent plasma made a major contribution to the fight against COVID when there was nothing else available. And the reaction of American physicians in abandoning plasma in the winter of 2021 to me, illustrates major problems in their ability to evaluate clinical data. And uh, we need to refocus on, on how people process information. 
which is, I think, a, a major problem, not only in medicine, but in other parts of human endeavor. So with that, I will end and uh, stop sharing. Thanks, Arturo. That was uh, quite a walk through memory lane with a lot of a lot of information. We're starting to get some questions come in, and I think we could probably dive into them. Um, so, Gester was asking about pre-existing antibodies and uh, enhancing or negatively impacting immune responses. Um, and he was sort of talking about um, anti-D prophylactic therapy and research, or rhesus negative mothers pregnant with rhesus positive fetuses. Um, the Nusenzen group has a paper in press in Nature indicating monoclonal therapy is a negative impact on B cell development after vaccination, presumably, you know, hiding some of these epitopes um, is what, what he's been communicating. But what do we know about the development of B cell responses in infected patients undergoing uh, plasma therapy? So, I, so papers have been shown that people mount comparable immune responses. There is, that was one of the concerns early on that if you gave antibody, you were gonna blunt the immune response somehow. It did not happen. Uh, let me put it to you this way. You also have a huge natural experiment going on. You have people that have been immunized getting COVID and getting COVID and then immunized. And what you find is that these people mount the, the richest plasma that is out there. Uh, to give you an example, in 2020, you would have been uh, lucky if you basically ended up with a set of plasma that had one to 60, one to 160 tighter. Today, the, the many or the automated uh, machines don't stop recording after one to 20,000. We're talking about logarithmic more antibody in this plasma. So I think those concerns don't hold to the reality of the experience. I mean, I am sure that one can see an immuno, one can predict certain types of immunological effects, but certainly the, the human experience doesn't, doesn't seem to validate that. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. I think um, just to, I'm not sure if you saw the New England paper last week from Stan and Dean Fullman talking about the correlates. I was wondering, I mean, you should be able to do this back of the envelope calculation in terms of convalescent plasma to titers, neutralizing titers. And you know, there's a paper from Laura Walker as well, looking at the monoclonal experience with Udagio or Vivid antibody where they sort of back calculated how much antibody you'd actually right. need, right? And so have we done that with convalescent plasma? So, so, it, 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 so some people, so the answer is yes and no. It turns out that, you know, serology gets no respect, but this is a really tough problem. You know, it's a really tough problem because whether you correlate, I mean, I see Khalid is smiling, I know. <laughs> I know, I know I'm preaching to the converted here. Is it going to be very a huge problem? But the way that we are approaching it in our lab is we are trying to pull out all the antibody with virus with a with with uh, with bees coated with antibody with, and just to remove it and quantitate it because I I'm really concerned that a lot of these uh, core, you know you run it versus a standard that there are so many uncertainties affinity dilutional errors things like that that it's it's very hard. To go on, but but I I will tell you that I think at the end of the day, if you said okay, this unit of antibody has five milligrams of it, and this monoclonal has so many milligrams that these things are not comparable. I mean, one of them is polyclonal, the other one is monoclonal, and I think that we are at the limits in some ways of what immunology can do. And I can imagine a lot of good basic science out of this. Yeah, um, we had another question from Fred, and I think we just guess there. I'm not sure if you wanted to to follow up on your um, note. I, I can because uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, so I, I'm really happy with your answer. It was a very good answer, but I was really trying to fish out: Has anybody really looked into naive individuals? Because I think the Nusmeg group was really looking also into naive individuals and all the clinical data from, for example, on D are in really naive individuals which seem to block the development of the actual response. But uh, the, 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 the picture you were sketching were actually, you were, you were talking about actually immunized individuals, which is not the same thing. Well, I, I, think, it, uh, I think the data from clinical trials 
where they have done naive individuals because this would have been 2020 that were treated with it shows that there is that the anti that there is no difference in antibody later on. Uh, so I the idea that an antibody infusion would suppress it it's you know it, I don't think it's viable with the available clinical data even though I know that there are immunological papers. I absolutely that agree. Phenomenon can happen. Yeah. Yeah, I absolutely agree. But I was just thinking if, if, and just wondering if anybody really looked at the kinetics of the responses, if they're delayed in any way or somehow So the question is that, that that is that they're not delayed, but again, people haven't done by week. They probably do it at six months or so. Yeah. Thanks. All right, so uh, another, I think we have two questions in the lineup. So Fred um, was asking about important lessons learned from the convalescent plasma story that can be applied to improve development and use of monoclonal antibodies to COVID and other infectious diseases. So I think the most important thing is that we need to know history. We need to go history. I mean, uh, and and the if I can say it to you is that much of the clinical research was set up with correct clinical research parameters, that is N, blinding, randomization, but nobody was asking the, the big, what is the biological plausibility of what you're doing? You know, um, and part of it has to do with, unlike, uh, unlike the monoclonals that were supervised by pharma, Pharma knew that they had to use them early. And pharma set up two types of trial, outpatient and inpatient. And you know what? They don't protect the inpatient because the same thing as the plasma isn't going to work. So I think the, to me, a really important aspect of this is to, to have somebody know the history of the field. Interesting point. Um, delete. Yeah, so I have a question also, Arturo. The, um, the data about the um, higher efficacy of CCP when it's found from your local environment was really interesting. And so I'm wondering if um, you've been able to, I'm sure you've thought about this, but it, is that because of just the variants that are circulating? Or is there something about the genetic or demographic properties of your environment? Or do you think that there might be other parameters in there like timing of collection to timing of infusion that could be really driving those differences? Because that seems to me like almost like a ring vaccine effect almost. Yeah, and so, I'm wondering so that, yeah, I just wanna put out the finding came out of a computer and an AI analysis. There were 30,000 dots and it found it. And then it's so striking, it's so powerful. The AI can tell you that it drops off at 150 miles. So the clinical trials that were shipping a plasma across the country in order to control everything were shooting themselves in the foot. But I think your answer, is, my, my God, so I, to, to, your very, to your very good question, I think the answer is I don't know. But based on what we know, we do know now that every city has their own quasi species. We did not know that at the time. And it may very well be that even when you measure, just things are neutralizing tighter, that there are all these other things that you are not measuring that are really important if your virus is close to the plasma. You know, because all this, all this plasma was, was checked. And it, that wasn't necessarily what was correlating. It was, it was geographic. That was published in Nature Medicine. Uh, Do you think now, so... I'm going to oversimplify the variant suit that's going on and also sort of the, the vac vaccinated population or pre-exposed population. Do you think two years, two and a half years in that we're getting to a place where um, there's a bit more consistency? So if we were to collect it now, you know, would it look more similar than... So Lisa, that's a very good question. The paradox is now that you almost don't need consistency because there is, they have so much antibody. You yeah, know, this, exactly. this is not 2020 where, where you were looking at 160 to 320 or something. You're talking about greater than 20,000. The machine won't give you a tighter. Um, so you're in a, a completely different space. But I think, look, we, for the majority of people, you don't need convalescent plasma anymore, right? You have Paxlovid, they're immunized, they got their antibody, they're not going to get sick. 
what's emerged today as the big problem is immunosuppressed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, as someone as someone who picked up COVID in a pediatric ER last week um, and who was able to get Paxlovid and recovered, maybe you need my, my plasma, I don't know, that's the truth. But um, yeah, I think- well, In two weeks, you will be a great donor. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's an interesting question how things have changed and what we can learn. I mean, is there any learnings from- you know, the flu space or something like that, where we could apply it. At, I mean, I know that they're not the same Ds and all that sort of thing, but maybe sort of where we're getting to a place where there's lots of variants. And, and so that sort the of answer is yes. If you look at the flu data, uh, the flu, uh, the RCTs were done too late. Mm -hmm. There is no RCT done early. Uh, it's interesting, even the ones that were published in 2019 were treating people in the ICU. Mm -hmm. uh, no wonder they couldn't see a difference in mortality. I think that today, what we know from this data is that if you have a nursing home outbreak, you show up there and you give it to people before they get sick. I mean, this is, you know, this is basic antibody 101. Uh, and that is very, really, this is an important lesson that I hope people that are thinking of other antibody based therapies. But now, here is the caveat in immunosuppressed time is suspended. So in the immunosuppressed, time is suspended. In the immunocompetent, time matters because eventually what's going to get the immunocompetent in trouble is their own immune system. That's what's going to put you in the hospital. You can't breathe on the unit. But in the immunosuppressed, time is suspended. So you, can, you no longer have the time. You, you can use it at any time. In the, uh, and there, what you need to probably do is to follow uh, the PCR and clinical symptoms. And speaking of time, I think we're at time. <laughs> it was, a, it was um, so good to see so many of you, good friends. I mean, this is fantastic overview of where we are with convalescent plasma. And thank you for all your work here, tireless effort to try and push this to patients in need. So we we thank you as a community or around that. Um, and I uh, really enjoyed your seminar. Thank you. Thank it's you, a pleasure. everyone. A pleasure visiting with you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.